This video is powered by the pros at Pascal Air Plumbing and Electric. Arkansas owned, Arkansas operated. GoPascal.com. Connor O'Gara joining us from Saturday Down South, senior national columnist and the usual guest here on Mondays. Connor, how are you doing today? What's new? Life is good, man. No complaints. This is the first week that we haven't had college football to watch uh, since. I don't know, man. I, I don't know, but it was great. Got to watch a lot of NFL over the weekend. I, I feel like it was, you know, a, a very, very strange occurrence for me to be sitting down on a Sunday and be like, I'd like to watch even more football and not feeling like, oh, you know, I, I've kind of had my fix on Saturday. I can't get enough college football, but I usually can't do a full day of NFL like I did yesterday. There were some good games yesterday. We were talking about that earlier, man. I was in, it kind of had a little March Madness feel or had the little feel at, at like the New Year's Six Bowls going on. It was fun. It did. Yeah. You know, that's, that, that's pretty rare, it feels like. And I, I don't know if it just feels like I, you know, I don't know if, if it always seems like that where we get two full days where it just feels like upsets and crazy things can happen. And I guess it wasn't really an upset filled weekend because there's only like what, I mean, the giants, I guess were the only underdogs one, but at the same time, I don't know. I just kind of, it kind of had that vibe to it. And maybe it was because I was very much hoping that Saquon Barkley and the giants would take care of the Vikings who may have been just a bit fraudulent, but yeah, it was, it was a fun weekend to watch some football. Uh, There's all these reports about TCU being interested in Kendall Bryles and it's picking up a little bit of steam today after they lose Garrett Riley to Clemson. Um, what am I, what am I missing here? He's been a successful offensive coordinator in the sec in the West. He's got his quarterback returning. You get three wide receivers that have transferred into the program that are all six foot four or taller. You got a great stable of running backs. Looks like the offensive line could be good again. Why leave Arkansas? You know, I mean, it sounds like there might be, you know, some interest on his part too. Yeah, I mean, this isn't the first time we've heard of this, obviously. You know, there was last year was Miami stuff, and then there was South Carolina stuff for a little bit. And, you know, we're trying to figure out what exactly his long-term goal is going to be. And the only thing I could think of from his perspective that would make more sense is if he has looked at what he's had to go up against in the SEC West these last few years, and he looks at the Big 12, who just had the Royals Award winner, and Garrett Riley, and a guy who wasn't even the most famous offensive mind in his own family going into last season, suddenly was the cat to meow at season's end. Now, if that's something that Kendall Bryles feels like he wants, and he wants to get back to the state of Texas, where obviously he has some roots, everybody knows about him coming up through Baylor, then you know what, then that, that's kind of his decision. But we've seen this play out before, and it does feel a bit like you know you do some of this for – for leverage, and that's, you know, agents behind closed doors making those decisions or at least pushing whatever's out there. But, yeah, to me, I look at Arkansas' situation just like you do, and I'm like, you have a lot more pieces to work with, and you have an identity that's established. It would be a different scheme fit at TCU. But, yeah, my guess, my guess is that he sticks around, but I guess nothing would surprise me. Well, I mean, and to your point, you even released, I think it was a couple of weeks ago, who you think were the best quarterbacks in the SEC for next year, and you get KJ at the top of the list. I mean, he's he's helped mold him into what he is, right? I mean, where 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 do you put the rest of the SEC as far as quarterback? Because and how far ahead of of everyone else do you put KJ as of now? And and is it KJ and Bryles together when you look at that? Yeah, that's that's a good question. That's a good question because if if you're suddenly going from KJ with a new coordinator with a new scheme then that obviously, you know, lends itself to to a different conversation about what his upside would be. But, yeah, I mean, I would still probably have him at or near the very top if he suddenly got a new coordinator. But I, I think he deserves to be number one right now in the SEC. I think he deserves to be a preseason first-team all-SEC guy. And, you know, for everybody that's going to say, well, what about this guy? What about Jackson Dart at Ole Miss? What a well, you know, what about this, these unproven quarterbacks with situations at Alabama, Georgia, and Tennessee? I'm like, I, I know what KJ is. I watched KJ get better. I watched KJ play at what I thought was an all-conference level, but all-conference in the SEC is obviously a different, a different equation than it is for, for some others. But, yeah, to me, I, I know what he is, and I continue to say I want that guy – 
leading my team two minute drive. I feel comfortable with his willingness to use his legs. I thought he took another step being able to have patience in the passing game. I thought his passing over the middle was much improved. And, and to me, I, I just think that he gives you a higher floor than what so many of these other guys do. And there's a change in the guard with quarterback in the SEC, no doubt. But to me, like I, I put him ahead of Devin Leary, who Devin Leary was preseason, uh, you know, ACC player of the year. And then he got hurt mid-season, but he also had pinned back as his offensive coordinator, so take that for what it is. Um, I, I look at KJ and say, yep, that would be my guy if I had to start an SEC team tomorrow and I got first pick of quarterback. So tell me about the new offensive coordinator at Mississippi State, Kevin Barbe, who was at App State previously. Like It'll be pretty interesting to see like how that offense is remade. And I'm, assume, I'm assuming it's not air raid any longer, and that means Will Rogers, you know, we find out if he's a – if he's a uh, you know system quarterback or not, what do you know about the Barbe offense and and how Will Rogers fits into that? Yeah, it, it's been kind of a mixed reaction. Um, and seeing the way that Mississippi State fans reacted, thinking and hoping that there was going to be a potential air raid disciple, I kind of bang the drum. I'm like, throw two million bucks at Garrett Riley. That was a guy that I thought would have been a perfect fit. I would have liked Chris Hatcher who's the coach at Stanford, who worked with Leach way back in the day, of course. I think that going to a new scheme, though, made sense. Because you got to remember, defensive-minded head coach and Zach Arnett, and if you can have your pick of what kind of offense that you run, yeah, he's not going to be running the offense, but what kind of offense do you want to run to help your team better, you know, have maybe a little bit of a better upside, I think you would probably go to a different system. And there are air raid principles that are all over different offenses. But what Barbe has done, working with Jim McElwain at Central Michigan, working at App State this past year. I mean, App State was like the cat meow for a little bit there, and obviously they didn't have the finish to the season that they are hoping for. But, you know, given the weapons that he's going to be able to work with at Mississippi State with somebody that's got so much experience fitting balls into tight windows in this conference, I would tend to think that the upside is still there. And I like a lot of the pieces that Mississippi State returns. I have Mississippi State as a preseason top 25 team. So, I, I, I do think it could be a nice fit. They're going to have more balance than what they've had because they're the least balanced team in college football. So, to me, I, I like the move, and I think it'll be a, a, a fairly easy transition, but obviously there are going to be questions asked by the fan base. Interesting signing uh, that Ole Miss makes, getting Pete Golding as the new defensive coordinator coming over from Alabama. Uh, was, this a, was this like a situation where – it's a addition by subtraction for Alabama because Golding had put together some good defenses, and I know this year maybe wasn't their best season defensively, but what did you think of Ole Miss? I don't even use the word poaching, but they did take him right off the Alabama coaching staff. If Alabama wanted to keep Pete Golding, Pete Golding would still be at Alabama. Let's, let's call it what it is. I mean, let's, <laughs> that's pretty obvious here. Right? I think we can all put two and two together and say that, but there, there are so many Alabama fans that grew frustrated with Pete Golding because – he didn't necessarily have the resume that a lot of other defensive coordinators have had before coming to Alabama. Somebody that was respected, like a Kirby Smart, a Jeremy Pruitt, to be able to have that position, that very elite title of Nick Saban's defensive coordinator. And Pete Golding, let's be honest, I mean, the face, he was an easy punching bag for Alabama fans. He really was. And these defenses that have not been at peak Nick Saban levels, they have put on him. Now it'll be interesting to see kind of how they move on, but it is fascinating to see Lane go into that situation and say, hey, you know what? He might be kind of on the outside looking in, might want a new, you know, a change of scenery. And Alabama doesn't seem eager necessarily to, to re-up him and keep him. So why not try and swoop in and get somebody there? You know, Lane Kiffin was somebody who just had his defensive coordinator, DJ Durkin, poached by a and last year. So I, I think that he took great satisfaction being able to go to Alabama's coaching staff and take one of their own. Connor, I do want to do what, – what are your top five quarterbacks in the SEC? Because I, I – as with you, I have KJ number one. Uh, what are your top five? And then who – when you talked about other guys coming in, who should we – maybe the fans don't know about who are another quarterback coming into the SEC from a different conference? Yeah, Matt, you set me up perfectly. My pin tweet right now is my way too early top tier SEC quarterback ranking. So, uh, shameless plug, at CJ Gear on Twitter. I've got my top four right there, which is KJ at one. Devin Leary coming in to Kentucky from NC State. I have him at number two. Jaden Daniels at number three coming back for LSU. And then Will Rogers at four. And I put Spencer Rattler at five. And I think Rattler is fascinating because if he's the guy that we saw these last three games of the season, like, look out. That, that's everything Spencer Rattler apologists have been waiting for. 
And it would be really interesting to see him with another full year in that offense, a little bit more continuity, even though you are replacing your coordinator, of course. But I am interested to kind of see the way that that plays out. And then, you know, guys that that I think are are worth watching, Carson Beck fascinates me. It is so rare in this day and age to have a quarterback that stays three years on the bench and then in his fourth year becomes the starter, a blue-chip guy who never left and is like, hey, I'd love to run the Todd Munkin offense which they return so many weapons at Georgia. It's insane. Whoever wins that job, whether it's Carson Beck, Brock Vandegrift, uh, there's even a lot of people hoping Gunnar Stockton can win the job as a redshirt freshman. Like They are set up to be really, really good offensively once again. So he's kind of the dark horse that could very easily enter that top five in probably the early part of the season. So, I mean, you want to talk about emotional swings <clears throat> for uh, anybody. Uh, the Georgia Bulldog Athletic Department, the uh, – the Georgia fan base, I mean, from the highs of the highs of a blowout win in the national championship and then the celebration and the parade and, I mean, right into the tragedy of losing uh, two young members of the football program in Devin Willick and uh, Chandler Lee Croy, who was part of the uh, recruiting uh, staff. And I know a couple others that were in the vehicle were injured but are, uh, are expected to be just fine and survive. Um, I mean, it's... <clears throat> It takes a while to uh, be able to recover from this. We don't know the circumstances around the crash, but we just know that it's uh, it's a tragic situation there. Um, and, you know, I think everybody's heart goes out to uh, to the Georgia football program. You know, with that said, Connor, the, 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 the parade was interesting in and of itself, just like watching the videos of Stetson Bennett, and he just seemed really disinterested in the whole situation. And then... You know, I don't have time to play the the ninety seconds that he spoke to the Georgia fan base, but it was almost like he was he was telling them you didn't like me very much, and it was kind of like he was acting throughout the parade that he didn't like them very much. It's just a really, intro- I don't want to say surprising because we know that most of that Georgia fan base for a good chunk of them like they openly didn't want him to come back, and he comes back and goes undefeated again. It's just it, does does Stetson Bennett hate Georgia fans? I don't think he hates Georgia fans. I think he was annoyed by the situation. I think he was annoyed that he had to prove himself time and time again to a fan base that, I mean, it's different if you're Alabama and you're winning winning national championships on a yearly basis. This was Georgia. Georgia hadn't won a national championship since 1980. I mean, he still was in that position where 13 months ago, guys, like, we're we're saying, hey, J.D. Daniels, like, you got to put him in, Kirby Smart. What are you doing? You're going to ruin this all-generation defense, and all Stetson Bennett does is put to put together one of the most impressive postseason runs ever in a two-year stretch. I mean, four offensive MVP honors and playoff games? I don't know that we're ever going to see anything quite like that ever again. And here he is in this position where he's being celebrated like, oh, we loved you the entire time. And Georgia fans grew to love him, and I'm not saying this is everybody, but yeah, there's a, per- there's a part of him that still has that chip on his shoulder, and maybe the fact that this was like you know, five days removed from winning a national championship. We know that Stetson Bennett likes to get into a little Pappy Van Winkle. I'm just saying if the kid was a little bit tired after five days of celebrating and maybe he wasn't feeling totally up for it when it's 40 degrees outside, all right, you know what? I've seen people pretty disinterested at a parade. But, yeah, I think this is just kind of Stetson's overall vibe and his kind of disposition. Not to say that he's just over it, but I think there's a part of him that still feels that chip on his shoulder and he has no problem being able to express that. Bet Online remains your number one source for all your sports betting this season. Everything from the NFL and bowl season to esports. You'll find the latest odds, team matchup info, player news, and game trends at Bet Online. Bet Online features live betting, free contests, and live scores for almost any sport or game imaginable. We're the fastest and easiest way to bet on all your favorite leagues and events. Head to betonline.ag to join and receive a 50% welcome bonus on your first deposit. Make sure to use the promo code BELIEVE to receive your rewards. That's B L E A V. Bet Online, where the game starts.